Hello, friends. Welcome to episode 1,235 of the Juice Box Podcast. I'm back with part two of the Resilience series with Erica Forsyth. Erica, of course, is available at ericaforsyth.com. Don't miss her. If you didn't check out part one, that's going to be episode 1229. It's called Resilience in Four Parts. Number one, this is number two. Check them out in order. Nothing you hear on the Juice Box podcast should be considered advice, medical or otherwise. Always consult a physician before making any changes to your health care plan. When you place your first order for AG1 with my link, you'll get five free travel packs and a free year supply of vitamin D. Drink AG1.com slash juice box. If you're looking to save 30% at CozyEarth.com, just use the offer code juice box at checkout and you'll save 30% off of the entire cart. Whatever you put in it, 30% off. If you have type 1 diabetes and are an American citizen, that's a U.S. citizen with type 1 or a U.S. citizen who is the caregiver of someone with type 1. I need you to go to t1dexchange.org slash juicebox and complete their survey. It helps type 1 diabetes research. It'll take you about 10 minutes. It helps the podcast. It helps you. t1dexchange.org slash juicebox. This episode of the Juicebox podcast is sponsored by the Eversense CGM. An implantable six-month sensor is what you get with Eversense, but you get so much more exceptional and consistent accuracy over six months, and distinct on-body vibe alerts when you're high or low. On-body vibe alerts? You don't even know what that means, do you? EversenseCGM.com slash juicebox. Go find out. This show is sponsored today by the glucagon that my daughter carries, Gvoke Hypopen. Find out more at gvokeglucagon.com forward slash juicebox. This episode of the Juice Box Podcast is sponsored by U.S. Med, usmed.com slash juice box, or call 888-721-1514. U.S. Med is where my daughter gets her diabetes supplies from, and you could too. Use the link or number to get your free benefits check and get started today with U.S. Med. Well, I'm going to start recording just in case you say something insane. Go ahead. Okay. Okay. (laughs) So I'm excited. We're going to talk about trauma today. Um, This sounds funny saying those two words together, but mainly I'm excited just because there's there's so much to share. I'm not quite sure which direction we'll go, how much we'll cover, but what I'm relearning and relearning and remembering is there's just, there's so many different ways to talk about trauma and adversity and understand it, but hopefully we'll do it. A, a good job. I'm sure today. we will. I'm going to open up my doc. I have a document for you yes. from here. So I'm going to open that up. Do you have that? Episode two, what is trauma? I have it right mm-hmm. here. I, you know, I'll say this real, very, very quickly before we start. I interviewed mm-hmm. a lady yesterday. This has nothing to do with this, but it does. She's a 31, mother of three. Her oldest has type one. And then her two youngest have like a severe and rare genetic issue. It's going to plague them their entire lives, right? And I don't know that I've laughed more with a guest in an hour than I have (laughs) doing this. And at the end, we talked about it and she just said, you know, like, what am I going to do? Like, I can't let myself feel the weight of this constantly. And so, like, I get the like, hey, we're going to talk about trauma today. (laughs) I'm so excited. (laughs) Uh, Like, like, because it's information you don't get to give people and then they can hopefully take something from it. So let's jump right in. But, you know, laughing along the way sometimes helps. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Okay. So go go to it. Okay. Wonderful. So I know we we covered a little bit, we might be a little bit repetitive from our introductory episode on resilience. That's kind of our overarching theme here. But we talked on our first episode in this series about, before we talk about resilience, it's important to really understand what trauma means and what definition we're operating from as we talk about resilience. Mm -hmm. And so I love and appreciate this definition. Again, I'm I'm using a lot of information from Dr. Bruce Perry from his book with Oprah called uh, What's Happening to You. And I also pull a lot of information from Brene Brown. If the three of you ever catch wind of this and want to come on with us, that would be so great. (laughs) Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So 
So Dr. Bruce Perry talks about trauma from the three E's. So first we want to think about the event itself. This could be a one-time event, such as like a hurricane, a death in the family, a diagnosis. One of the examples they give in the book, I think is really helpful. Imagine there's a fire at an elementary school and it's in the near the first grade classroom. And he talks about how the trauma is perceived through three different people. So the, the firefighter arrives and they are not traumatized, right? It's, it's more of a resilience experience for them. They, they know it. They know how to deal with it. They're trained. And then from the, the first grader, because the fire is right near their classroom, the first grader responds in fear. Their stress response system is highly activated. That's going to be a trauma for this child. The fifth grader, who is a couple classrooms on the other side of the school, sees the fire. It might be kind of kind of scary, but also kind of exciting. But he knows he's further away from the fire and he feels safer. Mm. So that's the example of how an event, even though we might hear, wow, there was, there was a fire at the elementary school, how traumatizing for everybody there. It's important to remember that everyone who experienced that event came at it from a different lens based on their experience, their training, their age, their relationship to the actual event in, in terms of space. Mm-hmm. And so that that's important. And I think also we kind of can look talk about that with the pandemic, right? That we can say that the pandemic was a trauma for everyone and actually it, it wasn't. It was trauma traumatic for some people. And that's a whole, you know, it's a whole other series. You'll hear people say, this is the best thing that ever happened to me. You know, like I, I didn't have to leave my house. I saved a bunch of money, blah, blah, blah. You know, the next person would be, I couldn't get out of my house. I couldn't make any money. You know, the, yeah, exactly. So your perspective, mm-hmm. both intellectually and physically, like literally like where you're standing during the event. Yes. Yeah. Yes. It's interesting. So that is, that's the second E, the experience, right? Oh, okay. So what I just described was the event, which is the fire, or we could, you could again, talk about it through the lens of the diagnosis and we'll go into, I want to stay in the the diabetes theme a little bit more today. Mm -hmm. So the experience of the event, and we'll also go into why that is harder for some people or more challenging based on genetics and based on family history, generational trauma. We, We talked a little bit about that in the first episode. And then the effect, did this event lead to any lingering long term effects that were challenging. If you take insulin or sulfonylureas, you are at risk for your blood sugar going too low. You need a safety net when it matters most. Be ready with Gvoke Hypopen. My daughter carries Gvoke Hypopen everywhere she goes because it's a ready to use rescue pen for treating very low blood sugar in people with diabetes ages two and above that I trust. Low blood sugar emergencies can happen unexpectedly. And they demand quick action. Luckily, Givo Kypopen can be administered in two simple steps, even by yourself in certain situations. Show those around you where you store Givo Kypopen and how to use it. They need to know how to use Givo Kypopen before an emergency situation happens. Learn more about why Givo Kypopen is in Arden's Diabetes Toolkit at givoglucagon.com slash juicebox. Givoke shouldn't be used if you have a tumor in the gland on the top of your kidneys called a pheochromocytoma, or if you have a tumor in your pancreas called an insulinoma. Visit gvokeglucagon.com slash risk for safety information. Okay, so that's what we're, when we're thinking about trauma, we're always kind of thinking through the, the event, the experience, and the effect. Also important to note that we're talking, this is like the big T trauma, the one time event. Mm-hmm. But Dr. Bruce, Dr. Perry talks about how we can have these little T traumas, these micro moments. And he defines trauma as any pattern of activating your stress response system that leads to an alteration in how that system is functioning, which leads to an overactivity or overreactivity. So, for example, and again, in the book, they talk about how a person, a child in a minority, in a classroom, for example, of a different skin cuddler, has these microaggression, micro moments, right? But any, it could be any moment or feeling that you don't belong, 
or you feel stupid, or you feel invisible, or you feel shamed. That pattern of non-event trauma can lead to a big T trauma because your stress response system is perpetually being activated when you feel like you're, and I'm thinking about now from the diabetes lens, as a child sitting in the classroom, not to compare racism to sure. living with diabetes, but the experience I think can can feel similar for the child if they're sitting in the classroom and their alarm goes off and they're feeling different or they're feeling em- embarrassed or that they don't belong. That can't over time for all the reasons we're going to get into that non-event trauma can be a pattern which can lead to big T trauma for the person, right. individual. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Another way to define trauma from Brene Brown is a situation or environment over which you have no control. So, I mean, gosh, isn't that what we feel like a lot of the time, particularly the beginning of living with diabetes? Feeling like you've been, I think we can think about the diagnosis of diabetes as a big T trauma event, right? We, a lot of us have described and shared on the, on the podcast or in my office about that big T trauma diagnosis story. Mm -hmm. And we talk about, it's really important to, to process and grieve that story, that diagnosis story. And then there's like the phase two, right? Of this non-event trauma with this pattern of maybe feeling like you are constantly out of control. Mm. And that can be experienced for some of us as trauma that's being repeated over and over and over again. Because as, as they say, it, Dr. Perry in the book says, activating your stress response in ways that are controllable, predictable, and moderate that leads to resilience. And this is where, we're, where I want to make sure I might kind of fumble around here a little bit with my words. But when we are experiencing living with diabetes as a repeated trauma over and over and over again, one of the reasons could be that in your development, in your time as a child, that you were exposed to your, your stress response system was activated because you were exposed to uncontrollable, unpredictable, or prolonged, and ex- that was prolonged or extreme. And that leads to traumatic changes in your brain and functioning. So if you're already sensitized to this experience because of your past trauma, that could be possibly why this repeated kind of when every time you have to change your pump or you, ha- or you hear the alarms, that can be more challenging for you to manage your diabetes or experience, you're experiencing that trauma over and over again. Mm-hmm. This is just one of the, the I, potential. Yeah. I'll share an ex- experience with you from my family. Okay. So obviously Arden's had a couple of seizures over the last, however many years she's had diabetes. Right. So that's a, a traumatic event. I yes. can say that for certain for her, for us, for everybody involved now, even still to this day, if she experiences like a compression low on her CGM, which all of a sudden shows a very low blood sugar, and uh, it happens in the middle of the night, for example, my wife wakes me up. She says, Arden's low. And I look and I go, hey, you know what? This is a compression low. It's not real. It's going to bounce back in a minute. If it doesn't, I'll call her, tell her to roll over or whatever. Right. And then that's it. Five minutes later, we've got the whole thing sussed out. It was a compression low. Arden's blood sugar is actually 92. It's not a problem. My wife cannot go back to sleep. It might as well have been that someone ran into the room banging a gun onto a trash can lid yelling, I'm going to kill you. I'm going to kill you. I'm going to kill you. My wife is lit up at that point. No matter how many times it happens, she can't get it under control. Okay. Yes. So that is her stress response system is being activated. Mm -hmm. And if if I'm, I'm going to try to explain the brain. And again, if you guys are interested, they have great charts and explain how the brain works in the, in the book, what happened to you. But he shares this example of, I'll stick to what you just shared. So if you think about our brain as an upside down triangle, at the base is the brain stem, okay? And at the top is the cortex, which does like all of our thinking, you know, planning. That's kind of like the highest level of our brain. And then at the bottom is the brain stem. And so the, the systems at the top, he says, are responsible for speech and language, thinking, planning, our values and beliefs are stored there. And at the top, this is the part of the brain that can't tell time, right? So when 
the cortex is online and active, we can think about the past and look forward to the future. When she hears the alarms through the brainstem, her stress response system is activated as if it's back in the past that she's having the seizure mm. and all the feelings that she experienced. Because at the bottom of the brain, this is the part that controls less complex, mostly regulatory functions like body temperature, breathing, heart rate, and so forth. But there are no networks in the bottom part that think or tell time. Sometimes we refer to this part of the brain as the reptilian brain. So think of what a lizard can do. They don't plan much or think. They mostly live in the moment and react. But we humans, thanks to the top part of our brain, the cortex, we can invent, create, plan, and tell time. So input from all of our senses, vision, hearing, touch, and smell, first comes into the brain in the lower areas. None of our sensory input goes directly to the cortex. Everything must first come to lower parts of the brain. So as soon as the signal comes in, so you, we hear the alarm. Mm -hmm. Under this example, the signal comes into the brain stem. It is processed. And basically, the incoming signal is matched against previously stored experiences. This is what we're describing. This is what we've now just discovered is post-traumatic stress disorder. Right. The sound is coming in and it's now being matched against previously stored experiences, which is, oh my gosh, Arden's having a seizure. Mm -hmm. And you go immediately back into all of the fear, stress response that you experienced at that time. Yeah. Does that make sense? Oh, and I'm, reading, I'm no. reading out of the book just to make sure I get it totally no, accurate. I appreciate that. It makes total sense. It's what I assume is happening. I just, it does not seem to be a way to like, consciously talk yourself out of it. You know what I mean? I have heard recently, I don't know if this is going to take you down a, a rabbit hole you're not interested in or not, but I keep hearing about people doing like stuff like ketamine treatments with therapists mm -hmm. and stuff like that, where they're basically like, I guess kind of the way I've heard it described is there's a disconnect of your memories, like it almost disconnects your mind from your body. And then you do the therapy during that disconnect. And then when you come back together again, the connection's gone. Is that something you've paid any attention to? Like the disassociation while you're, because you're trying to rewire and retrain some of those neuro pathways. Mm -hmm. There's so many different types of therapy. You know, we've talked about EMDR, yeah. there's CBT, you know, hypnosis, there's the ketamine treatment. Hopkins um, is doing mushrooms, right? Yes. A yeah. lot, there's a lot of people experimenting with that. Right. And the, the goal is all the same. It's just kind of a different pathway to get there mm -hmm. of reframing, restructuring, and recreating the narrative around when you are hearing or touching or feeling, you know, we get all this input from our senses. Yeah. And then we also have from our memory, right? This, so we're, as soon as those things are being matched, what we're then wanting to go through a therapeutic process is say, okay, no, no, no. I, actually, it's really important to understand the why. Mm -hmm. Like, why am I, why do I react this way every time I hear this alarm? And then to go through the process of saying, no, I'm actually, this is what's happening and I am safe yeah. here. And that's, I mean, I'm really, you know, Pairing it down, but that's what all of these different types of therapies are doing. I believe they're pretty expensive still, and I'm certainly not telling you just to go like down a K hole and talk yourself out of like feeling you know bad. But I've heard at this point there are famous people who have talked about it publicly. But mm -hmm. I'll, two that stick in my mind: Trevor Noah, formerly from The Daily Show, mm -hmm. who grew up in South Africa with parents of two different colors, so literally the mother had to pretend that he wasn't hers when they were in public. And then she later remarries a man who was like very abusive. So he described his life like he, you know, it's his to describe, but he had a lot of problems. He did this ketamine therapy and he seems like a different person. Mm -hmm. The next person I've heard talk about this kind of treatment, who's a famous person is a comedian named Neil Brennan, who, if you listen to him prior to his treatment, he was in trouble. Like, I mean, he was, he was out of his mind and not doing well by his own admission and then went and did one of these therapies. And now you listen to him. And I mean, my goodness, he sounds like a completely different person. It feels like someone reached in and removed those memories from having a connection from his body to his brain is the best mm -hmm. way I can describe how it is. And I don't know the first thing about it, but I, I'll tell you every time I hear someone talk about it, 
I think there are people in my life who would really benefit from this. Anyway, hopefully it gets studied more and more. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, that trauma, even the concept of trauma and how it impacts mental health wasn't even really studied intensely until 25 years ago. Really? According according to Director Perry. Okay. And so it's this, and, and PTSD, the diagnosis wasn't in the DSM, which is a book that psychologists, therapists, doctors use to, to diagnose. There's a whole controversy around even, you know, diagnosing, but the PTSD wasn't even a, a diagnosis until around the early 1980s. Mm, that's interesting. So it's all this concept of trauma and developmental trauma and how it impacts our ability to function and, and be resilient is really new. Yeah. Um, and it's, it, I think that's what's exciting about it, particularly as we think about it through the lens of our, what we're living with the chronic illness. I used to hate ordering my daughter's diabetes supplies. I never had a good experience and it was frustrating, but it hasn't been that way for a while, actually for about three years now, because that's how long we've been using U.S. Med. USmed.com slash juice box or call 888 721 1514. US Med is the number one distributor for Freestyle Libre systems nationwide. They are the number one specialty distributor for Omnipod Dash, the number one fastest growing tandem distributor nationwide, the number one rated distributor in Dexcom customer satisfaction surveys. They have served over 1 million people with diabetes since 1996, and they always provide 90 days worth of supplies and fast and free shipping. U.S. Med carries everything from insulin pumps and diabetes testing supplies to the latest CGMs like the Libre 3 and Dexcom G7. They accept Medicare nationwide and over 800 private insurers. Find out why U.S. Med has an A-plus rating with the Better Business Bureau at usmed.com slash juicebox, or just call them at 888-721-1514. Get started right now, and you'll be getting your supplies the same way we do. Today's podcast is sponsored by the Eversense CGM. Boasting a six-month sensor, the Eversense CGM offers you these key advantages. Distinct on-body vibe alerts when high or low a consistent and exceptional accuracy over a six-month period, and you only need two sensors per year. No longer will you have to carry your CGM supplies with you. You won't have to be concerned about your adhesive not lasting, accidentally knocking off a sensor, or wasting a sensor when you have to replace your transmitter. That's right, there's no more weekly or bi-weekly hassles of sensor changes, not with the Eversense CGM. It's implantable and it's accurate. EversenseCGM.com slash juice box. The Eversense CGM is the first and only long-term CGM. Eversense sits comfortably right under the skin in your upper arm, and it lasts way longer than any other CGM sensor. Never again will you have to worry about your sensor falling off before the end of its life. So if you want an incredibly accurate CGM that can't get knocked off and won't fall off, you're looking for the Eversense CGM. EversenseCGM.com slash juice box. Hey, before you move forward with what you're going to yeah. talk about, I have here, it's just from the NIH, but how does trauma change someone? Initial reactions to trauma can include exhaustion, confusion, sadness, anxiety, agitation, numbness, disassociation, confusion, physical arousal, blunted effect. Most responses are normal in that they affect most survivors and are socially acceptable. That's just something. Like, I mean, I don't think that anybody would imagine that just having a kid diagnosed with type 1 diabetes or having yourself diagnosed may bring some or all of these things to you. It's really crazy to go on. The brain areas implicated in the stress response include the amygdala, hippocampus, prefrontal cortex. As you were talking about earlier, traumatic stress can be associated with lasting changes in these brain areas. That's the part I wanted to like that I wanted to read. Like, it's not just a thing and then it goes away. It it sticks with you forever. And we can guess as to why maybe it's so that you remember to run from a saber tooth tiger or something like right, that. Right, you right. know, I don't like, you know, but there it is like, you know, in a world where we're not really in danger very often anymore, 
like suddenly you have something happen to you like this. It just seems like it's incredibly impactful from like a third party, you know, perspective of somebody like me who I'm not trained in any way, but it just seems like that the easier and better and safer life gets when something does happen, almost maybe the more impactful it can be. Maybe it's a thing we didn't see without war in the past because, you know, what a, an elevation obviously from your regular life to fighting in a war. And then you see all this PTSD coming back, but I can see where it, it could be impactful for people. And, and now the way you've explained it, how it's possible that they can't shake it, don't know why then it blends into their life. And now you just think of those people as one of these, you know, varied reactions. We, we say what's, what's wrong with you yeah. versus like what, what's happened to you. And right. I think it's really important to understand that even if you have, if you've had predictable traumatic experiences as a child and, and, and so doing you develop more resilience because mm-hmm. the, the pattern of it is, is, you know, like actually we can go, I want to touch on the, the, the stress system, but the pattern we talked about in the parenting series go ahead. where every, as a newborn, you were exposed to stressors, right? Mm-hmm. And I want to find, they talk about this in the book too. So you found it. Yes. Okay. Okay. Do you go ahead? Do you want to say something? Just that I feel like what you almost started to say a minute ago was almost like, you know, when you have an allergy to something and they'll tell you, like, have a little bit of it, then a little more, then a little more. So if you get to grow up in a reasonable way with reasonable people around you, you will have experiences of things not going well or almost even possible. But if they build slowly, then you'll build up a tolerance for them. And that looks like resilience all of a sudden. The reason this pops into my head is that an acquaintance of ours passed away recently Mm. and she leaves behind some children, right? She was young and it is not a month later. And this poor family's dog needs to be put down. And it's just the saddest thing, you know, but it occurred to me if that dog just would have died a year ago, they would have been a little more prepared for their mom passing away unexpectedly. If they would have got the, what you think of is the, the right, version of these events happening in their lives. Like how many of us don't realize when we buy our kids a pet that that pet is going to help you somewhere down the road, be prepared for loss, you know? And I don't think anybody thinks about it that way, really, but it's true. And I was lucky people in my life did not pass away until I was older. I got to see less impactful things in my life come, go, live, die before my father passed away. And I think that made me more prepared for it. But if your mom dies in her 40s, and then a month later, your dog, and it's not your dog doesn't die, you have to take it somewhere to end Mm -hmm. its life. That is an unfair situation that you can't avoid that will undoubtedly impact those people for the rest of their lives, I think. You know, anyway, yes. I felt like you started to say that and then you got onto this and I just didn't want to lose that thought. So please go no, back. It's to, so good. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so our, as an infant, Dr. Perry says, you know, we're, we're, our brains are, are malleable. We don't, we're not born with resilience. We're born with malleability. And so when we go back and talk about, you know, the stresses and the traumas and how it impacts our brain, it does change the way our brain functions, but it can also be changed for, for growth and healing, right? Mm-hmm. So in, in the parenting series, we talked about as a, as a newborn, you know, the child's born hungry, they're, they need to be fed. If they're, they're hot, they're cold, and those needs are met by an attuned caregiver. And then as they are in, if they're in a safe space and they feel comfortable, the baby will crawl away and they'll experience a stressor and that'll activate their stress response system. And then when it's too much, they'll come back to the caregiver, Mm -hmm. to their safe base, right? And then they'll continue this process thousands of times as the newborn grows into a toddler and a young child. And then through these little challenges, they then build the capacity to develop and demonstrate resilience in the face of the unexpected stress. So here, you know, the emphasis is on it's okay like this is what a newborn in a safe, predictable environment where their needs are met initially, then they kind of feel more comfortable to go out and experience a little bit of stress. Oh, that was scary. I'm going to come back. For children who are in that environment, they are able to develop and build the resilience mm. through the predictable 
stressors, yeah. right? You can see them finding their their new boundaries. And that's the only way we really think about it, right? Like, oh, look, they feel safer going a little farther. Or I, you know, I finally went to the park and she wandered away from me when I said, go ahead, you can go play. And like that, you don't think about it the way you're talking about it now. You just think about it like that. It's so interesting to, yes, to hear you yes. talk about and, it like this. And not even every year they go to a new, they have a new classroom. They have a new teacher. These are all new stressors for the child as their, as their brain is developing and they might experience challenges to if they're coming back to the household where the stressors are predictable, controllable, mm -hmm. they're building resilience. Now, we can, as we talked about again in the parenting series, for, for children who grow up in an environment where the parent is hovering and wanting to prevent them from experiencing any hardship or any stress, it's challenging for that child's brain to develop that sense of resilience. Mm -hmm. Conversely, for the infant and, and newborn and child who is growing up in an environment where the stress is, there's chaos, there's, there's uncontrollable, unpredictable, prolonged extreme stress, that leads to the traumatic changes in the child's brain, right? Because now they're, they're, they're sensitized to any to trauma. So they are going to be on high alert. They act and react before thinking because that's how that behavior as a newborn, a young child is, is an adaptive behavior, yeah. right? I gotta, I gotta be alert. I gotta be try and find safety. And that's, that's what they've learned. And we talked about this in the first episode that war veterans, people who go to war, who grew up in that type of environment are so sensitized to trauma that they had higher rates of developing PTSD mm -hmm. versus the person who grew up in an environment where there was the stress was controlled and predictable. Then they went to war and they did not develop PTSD. Yeah. Um, and the say we could apply the same thing to the diabetes diagnosis. If you are listening and you have found, gosh, you're thinking, wow, I, I grew up in a childhood. My environment was really unpredictable there was chaos, there was abuse, there was neglect. And then and then later you get diagnosed or you're caregiving for your child and you're experiencing these traumatic episodes or symptoms or behaviors. Mm -hmm. This that could be why. Again, this is not it's not black and white. This is not either this or that. But we just want to kind of give some potential kind of background as to why you might be experiencing this. Can I jump in for a second? Please. I'm hearing stability breeds resilience. I'm hearing lording over people impairs resilience. And that once these alerts are set off, then that's the reaction moving forward. So if your kid or you or whoever's just recently diagnosed and something gets low or high and you freak out and you keep freaking out when those things happen, then when they happen, you're going to freak out before you even have a chance to freak out. Like your brain's going to go, oh, here it is. The thing beeped. The lady's going to come in here and yell at me now. Blah. And then, you know, then you come in and talk to your kid and go, I don't understand. All they have to do is this and blah, blah. And then you tumble down that rabbit hole of just this is a mess. And I was talking to a lady yesterday or 11 year old was talking about not wanting to be alive because of type one diabetes. And I tried to help her a little bit talking online. And I said, what do you think it is? She goes, so it's obviously a, a, a divorced household. So there's four parents. She goes, I just think she's tired of having four people after her all the time. And I said, have you considered not being after her all the time? Just set up some basic touch points. Like we're going to definitely pre-bolus our meals and we're going to test for sure two hours later and correct if, we get, if, if, if it's necessary. And just set that up as an expectation and then let that go for a little bit and see if that autonomy doesn't help her to feel more in control and like everybody's not yelling and talking to her all the time. Like maybe go backwards. And the person was really grateful and said they were going to try it. But your other point about if I grew up in a crazy household, then I move forward and I have my own household and something happens. It just makes me want to say this. And I'm so sorry if they hear this and they ever feel badly, but you're helping a lot of people. So my wife's family, whether they know it or not, needs a bad guy. They need a foil. And they make one of them the foil constantly mm -hmm. until it burns out. Then they move it to somebody else. They are always, as a group, mad at one of them. And when they are, they're calmer. 
I don't know how to yeah. explain that by then, but I've watched it enough and I know it's happening. One of them has to be on the outs at all times or none of them can function. It's really interesting. Oh, there's a there's a phenomenon and I'm, I can't recall what that's called. I saw a real thing, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yes. Oh, I know it yes. for sure. Well, well, I'm going to look that up. I'll, I'll share back next okay. time. <laughs> also, I've, I've shared this on the podcast. My wife and I get along better when we have an adversary that is in common. Yes. Yeah. That, we talked about that. Very, very, very true. If we can have somebody to both be pissed at, we like each other better. Like when we're on the same team about something. It doesn't even have to be anything important. Yes. It's yeah. fascinating. What is that called? It's oh called my gosh. I can't, up is I, what it's called, Erica. I, no. <laughs> I can't recall. It's like way back here. Okay. But anyway, like my, my point is, is that with all this, it's like you might not understand Erica's point too, that the way you grew up is now impacting the way you're reacting to your diabetes, which is then impacting your kid's experience with diabetes which is going to have a direct impact on their health and happiness for their life, forgetting that it's also going to impact how they one day talk to their children, et cetera, and so on. Talking about diabetes specifically. So you got to fix your own thing or you're just going to make another problem somewhere. It's, I mean, it's overly simplified, but yeah, yeah. yeah it's yeah, just yeah. that easy. Yeah, yeah. Just go, just go uh, fix everything. And you'll be all right. Um, but I also wanted to the, the point of this, the diabetes, um, the divorce and diabetes and you know, and we know, we've talked about this. You talk about this all the time, but how stress, you know, can impact even the blood sugar, and we often forget and maybe compartmentalize diabetes without we forget that. Okay, well, what is it like for that child to be going back and forth and listening to, you know, the the different perspectives on how to manage her, the diabetes or what happened at school that day? And maybe that's why the numbers are higher, not just because they forgot to pre-bolus and not just because they hate you or they hate diabetes, but like how significant the trauma, big T, little t, the stress is impacting the blood sugar Yeah, is really significant. Listen, this might sound hocus pocusy to some people, but most of the things you're seeing are not happening for the reasons that you think they're happening. That I just know for certain. You know, like whether it's something your mom said to you 25 years ago, or if it's something more specifically the way you just react because of something like we've discussed here today that you're not even aware of or a thing that's happened to you when you were six and you don't even know that this new thing makes your body feel that way. I honestly think that I think that most of what is happening, most of people's reactions have so much less to do with their conscious decisions and much more to do with how all the wiring and chemicals fire off in your body, you know? Yes. And I, and I appreciate what you were talking about. I wanted to go back to the, the tree of regulation, the, you know, the neural networks in our, in our body and brain that help us process and respond to stress. And I think it's important to note that when we think about stress, we often think about it in this negative, like, mm. oh, I'm so stressed, right? That's the negative concept. He talks about how it's it's a demand, stress is a demand on one or more of our body's many physiological symptoms, such as hunger, thirst, being cold, hot, um, getting promoted at work, losing a job, getting diagnosed. So, and stress is an essential and positive part of normal development. And we just have talked about it's, it's key element in learning, like just that, you know, having just enough stress is important to master new skills, to build resilience. We have talked about, and what we want to determine is is it positive or destructive in the pattern, right? And he talks about with the core regulatory networks or neural systems originating in the lower parts of the brain, right? In the brain stem, spreading throughout the whole brain. They work together to keep us regulated. Your brain is constantly trying to keep you unbalanced. But when you are exposed to that unpredictable, uncontrollable stressor, mm -hmm. your core response system is 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 activated. And that can still, I guess I want to highlight too, that can still be happening. Let's say you grew up in a very calm and predictable household, but you're still feeling like, gosh, why every, like I'm still grieving and processing and I, and I cry every time I think about having type diabetes or I cry every time I think about my child having diabetes. It still could be that you're having this little T trauma, right? Every time you have to change the pump or Think about the carb ratio, 
and you're having this these moments. It also can be because it is really hard, right? Mm-hmm. So, um, and and it be having a big T trauma. So it's not just validated if you had a unpredictable childhood. Does that make sense? It I don't. Does. Yeah, <laughs> it does. Is this a good place to remind people that if your parents were heavy drinkers or alcoholics growing up, that you probably have a lot of issues that you're unaware of? And is that because of the unpredictability? Yes. So, and we haven't gone into the ACEs and maybe we'll save that for the next time too, but that's one of the, you know, adverse childhood experiences is being in a household with what one of the parents has substance abuse Mm -hmm. and in any type of abuse that you're exposed to, whether directly or indirectly, there's that unpredictability that is, creates your, your, your stress response system is triggered constantly. And then you become sensitized to that. And if you're looking for something to prove it to yourself, if you find yourself being the kind of person who always wants to make things okay in groups and your parents were alcoholics or substance abusers, just think, oh, that's why I, that's why I do that. Because you grew up around chaos and you were trying to calm it. And now you maybe Uh still do that in your adult life. Now, when you see chaos, your brain goes, oh, no, I know what's going to happen. He's going to get drunk and yell at her and she's going to hit me. And like, like, you know, like that whole thing's going to like tumble down. Or if I could just keep it calm right now, like I can stop that. I used to have that terribly. My parents weren't drinkers, but my father had a lot of anger. Like, and he would kind of like spark up out of nowhere. And when I first got married and we had kids, I had such a compulsion for no one to fight. Yes. I just never wanted anybody to be upset. And there's part of me that thinks it's because I thought that people being upset led to divorce and the end of your family. Like that's what I, what I think it was until I realized you cannot control people's reactions to things and that you could actually talk your way through them and come out the other side of them better off. I would literally, if it got too bad, I would try to yell down people being upset. Because I was so scared of what was going to happen if it if it boiled over, but not consciously. None of it was conscious. So I didn't yes. have those thoughts while I was doing it is what I'm saying. But for sure, that's what was happening. Yes. Yeah. You want peace, uh, adult children of, of either of alcoholics or the unpredictability in their mood know how to read a room. Mm-hmm. They know how to, is it safe or not? They know how to be peacekeepers they are going to try and control what they can, either internally or externally. Yeah. Um, because that's how they learned how to, that's how, that was a, an adaptive skill as a child. It's funny because it, it can lead to having some good resilience too, because you get skills from them. Like one of them is, I would be a great human resources director because <laughs> people are like, I've never met somebody who only has to talk to you for 10 minutes and then knows everything about you. Scott, like you meet somebody and he's like, you generally speaking, have them down pretty quickly. And I think that's a little bit about the read the room thing. You know what I mean? Like, is this new person? Is this new idea problematic? Is it going to cause an upheaval? I've got things calm now. Like, you know what I mean? Like, how do I, even when you talk to my brothers, my brothers will tell you like, oh my God, Scott fixed everything for us. Because I was like, I didn't know what was going to go wrong next. If, you know, especially after my dad left, like what if something else happens? Yeah. Anyway, like it's that's the kind of stuff that the interesting question there around resilience is, do those experiences make you resilient? Were you going to be a resilient person anyway? Did they hold you back? Did they benefit you? Yes or no? Who knows? I don't think that I was molded into this person only by those experiences, but I can see where I got lucky going back to the beginning because the first 10 or so years of my life were really stable. Then my dad got angry as I think his tolerance for being married got to the end. And then we got, I got through that. It wasn't terrible. And then I got through that, but then he left. Now that time was bad for like five years. That took a lot to get over. All the reason you think, like I, I thought it was my fault that my parents got divorced. You know, all the stuff that happens to people, mm-hmm, regularly speaking. Mm-hmm. got through that, became an adult. And then started paying closer attention to what was happening to me, what I was doing, and then kind of came out of it. But still, it was still a a reasonably regulated pathway. Good, little worse, terrible, I'm alive, things are getting better. 
new problems come up. I can apply what I learned before. But if you move that stuff out of order, I just got lucky, maybe. You know what I mean? If you move that stuff out of order, my dad leaves when I'm five. My mom gets pissy and starts hitting me when I'm 10. I'm probably a disaster by the time I'm 15. You know what I mean? Like, that's random. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, timing is really important. Mm -hmm. The specific effects that you talk about on your health, in addition to what you were exposed to as a child, I think it's also important to note that genetic vulnerability, the developmental stage at which the traumatic event occurred, the history of your previous trauma, your family's history of trauma, and this is, I'm quoting from the book, and the buffering capacity of healthy relationships, family, and community. So all of those things, you know, we talked about, and you've often wondered before of like, did you just get lucky? Is it just like the hardiness of yeah. your brain and adaptivity to stressful situations? Mm. I think all of these things are really important to note and understand. And we'll, we'll talk more about the significance of being in community. But I think that the, the history, the genetic vulnerability he goes into, I'm not going to go into it in detail because it's really complicated, but he talks about the epigenetic factor. Epigenetics is another one of those widely used and poorly understood terms in our field, um, in the psychological field and neurological field. He says that can be part of why someone might have a certain hardiness, resilience versus someone being more maybe sensitive mm -hmm. just just by strictly your your genes yeah and and if you want to learn more about that you can certainly read more about the epigenetic factors i know nothing about nothing but it would be hard to make me believe that there's not some imprinting that happens generationally as well mm -hmm. you know what i mean and i always use the same example of like like the irish potato famine like and mm -hmm. how that may have impacted like generations of people from ireland or internment camps or you know nazi germany or like any of these big ideas that it, that impacted people on a whole and how it it could get translated a little bit maybe through genetics and maybe and a lot obviously through the, your parents lived through this experience and now they're parenting you through the vision that you know through the lens of that experience so those things mixed together there are things we know to be afraid of and i don't know why i'm like Spiders. Like, why are we afraid of spiders? Mm -hmm. you, you know what I mean? Like, is it because spiders used to be 19 feet tall and like it stuck in? <laughs> like, I don't know. You, you know what I mean? Like, is it, is it, is that kind of a thing? Like, how real is that? But I, if I had to guess, I think there's a lot of reality of that idea that, the, you know, if your parents grew up very poorly and were treated terribly, that maybe you're already predisposed to being in that, like having some of those feelings that they had. And, and over generations, maybe. I have no idea. Like, I don't know how you would prove any of that, but it certainly makes a reasonable amount of sense to me. Are we going to cover privilege before we get done today? No, I wanted to talk about one more thing, though. And so, Do we okay. have time? I have time if you have time. Okay, okay. I make a podcast, well, I think... Erica. I have nothing but time. <laughs> You're a professional person. <laughs> um, I just wanted to end with like a tip or a tool instead of waiting till like the end of okay. the whole series. Nice. And listening to a lot of, a fan favorite of Brene Brown, as we all know, on the very beginning of the pandemic, she launched her podcast called Unlocking Us, one of them. And she talked about FFTs, which is expletive first times, or you could do ter TFTs for your children, terrible first times experiences. And I was thinking, listening to that and thinking about that in context with, you know, this trauma as we define it as it could be any moment that you feel like you don't belong or you don't know what you're doing or you're invisible or you're embarrassed or shamed for anything diabetes related, how those little micro moments add up to this experience of living in a traumatic situation over and over and over again. Mm. And I think, well, for all the reasons that we just talked about today, you could be experiencing that. I was thinking, what if it also is, in, as we think about the diagnosis and like, let's say the first year of living with diabetes, everything, I know we talk about this a ton um, and it's talked about in the community that every time you experience something new, it's, it's a, for the first time. Yeah. The first time you go out for pizza, the first time you switch from injection to wearing a pump. Flying. Those are all... What? Flying freaks people out. Yeah. The first time they fly with diabetes, right? Oh, yes, and now I'm seeing because yes. you're combining two concerns. Oh, that's interesting. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, go ahead. Okay, mm. so we're thinking about the FFTs or, or TFTs. And when you're experiencing something new, you feel scared, you feel dysregulated, you might feel stupid, you might feel embarrassed or ashamed. That's something that we all experience. You can even think about like going, like starting a new job or learning a new skill, right? And it's she talks about how it's important to continue to be exposed to first times. That's more in like the skill set. But I was thinking about it through like every time you're experiencing something that you feel like you're out of control. She kind of gives these these three tips on what to do in this time. So this is kind of like we're understanding it as like it could be trauma. And or it could be this experience that feels like trauma, but it might also be because you're going through a new experience within the context of the chronic illness. And so the first thing you want to do is name it. Say, oh, I'm exper- I'm, I'm irritable. I'm upset. I'm crying. I'm angry because I'm. this is a first time. This is an FFT. You can even tell your kid like, oh gosh, we're, we're having a hard time here. This is, a, this is a terrible first time, a TFT, because... We're not robots, right? We don't, we can eat, try and eat the same thing at the same time, but we are going to experience our blood sugar variability differently every single day. Mm. And particularly, we feel that in the first, I'm saying year, but you know, it could be shorter or longer. So we say, oh, we're feeling this emotion. This is because we're having a, a TFT. Sometimes people get scared to call it or name it like that because we feel like we're going to give it more power. Like, oh, we're, we're going to talk, we're saying going flying is a, is a TFT because we're going to give it so much power. But it's really important to say, no, we're actually taking that power on. We're not giving it power, but we are feeling empowered because then we can affect change. We can do something about it. Yeah. Okay. So we're going to name it. We're going to, no, you're going to normalize it. Oh yeah. This is, yes, we're only in month two and we're trying to play all of the sports and go out to eat. This is this is normal to be feeling this way. We are feeling really scared and out of control. This is totally normal. Yeah. Like you're pre-bolusing confidence. Yeah. Right. Ooh. Yeah. Good right? One. Like you're giving good yourself, one. you're giving yourself some confidence ahead of time so that when the impact actually hits, you're a little above where you need to be. And when you lose a little bit of it, it it's still level. That's how it's how it's striking me. Go ahead, give me That's the third. That's interesting. I yeah. like that. Yeah. I like that. Okay, so the third one is pers- giving yourself perspective. You could say, well, gosh, because oftentimes I'll hear people say on, on the podcast or on the office, like, we've been nailing it for the past week. And then on Sunday, man, we just, we failed. Mm-hmm. We messed up. And I'm like, well, what, what was going on? What happened? I'm like, well, we went, you know, went out for Mother's Day brunch, you know, or whatever. And we didn't get the timing. And so I'm like, oh, well, just because you didn't nail it that time doesn't mean you have failed in all the other areas, right? Like, so you're just, you're giving it context to say, this is an FFT. This is a TFT. It's a terrible first time. And you might be feeling this over and over and over again. Mm-hmm. But in yourself of giving perspective to say, you know what? It's not, it's not always going to be this hard. Right. That's hard to do in the when you're grieving, when you're experiencing the trauma over and over again, if it is feeling like a, a true big T trauma. I think this is why I tell people all the time when they're newly diagnosed that as crazy as this feels right now, a year from now, you'll look back on this time and not recognize yourself. You know what I mean? Like Because those little experiences build up into real experience that you can then put into practice and stop them from happening in the future. And then you'll look back and you'll think, Oh God, I was like, I was out of my mind back then. Like, how did I, how did I get to here? Like I'm, I'm so much further off, but you need it. And I want to just be clear. FFT means f-ing first time, right? Yes. Okay. Yes. You didn't want to say it cause you're a polite <laughs> I person. I didn't want to say yeah, it. It's fine. <laughs> yes. But yeah. yeah. So like having the idea that we are going to have these first experiences, they are likely not going to go well. Let's expect for them not to go well. So it's not such a crushing defeat when it happens, right? Like I can just go, oh yeah, I didn't, how did I think that was going to go? It's interesting. It really is. Like, it's like sending a kid up to bat for the very first time and just telling them, look, just try to hit the ball. It's not easy. You're probably not going to hit it, but it's okay. You will eventually. And just go ahead and try it. It'll be, if it's fun, it's fun. If it's not, it's not, but it'll be what it is. We'll build on it. That's it. That's what yes. this is, right? That idea. Yes, yeah. and and what you're saying is the um, actually this is the third one. The, the 
the, the first one was normalize it. The second one is give it perspective. The third one is reality check okay. the expectations, which is what you just did. Okay. To say, you know, you might not hit the ball the first time. You probably you might strike out. It's and okay. you know what? That's okay because that's what that's normal. Right. And I think oftentimes we experience so much pain and grief when we are we have an expectation of nailing it, mm-hmm. whatever that is. And then we don't. And then we then that shame cycle can play in and, and the trauma we can experience again of like, oh, yeah, we didn't get it. Well, how I have this disease. This is this is really hard. And again, this is all really normal. And this can happen 30 years into diagnosis, too. Yeah. You could have, you know, you know, getting pregnant, going through menopause, going through a tragedy, a loss. We can experience an FFT and go through these things again because when we have that expectation, I'm like, oh, I've, I've nailed it for so long. How come I am not? Yeah, yeah. It's important to, right to contextualize it. Mm-hmm. I want to say how important it is when you're teaching a child to field a ground ball. Like they don't do well at first and they're scared as it comes to them. You can see them being scared the first time they stand their ground. And even if they don't catch it, it's such an important thing to walk up to them and say, hey, hey, you didn't catch it that time. But I like that you that you stood your ground. You didn't move. You didn't flinch. You stood there like you're getting this this is coming like we're going to hit you 10 more. You're going to get one, you know, because everything isn't always like fail, succeed. Sometimes there are levels of better before you get to good. And I think that's important to celebrate those along the way. I don't know if this fits here, but it feels like it does to me. Like, you know what I mean? Like, it's not just all or nothing. As a matter of fact, and this is apropos of nothing at the moment, I have a note here for myself that says, after resilience, talk to Erica about all or nothing thinking. Mm -hmm. That's going to be the next thing I make you do on the podcast. (laughs) <laughs> we talk about that a lot in the perfectionist yeah. mentality and, and even in, yeah, it does. I mean, it fits in here too, mm-hmm. where, yeah, you there, can't just say such a spectrum. <laughs> yeah. You don't just fail or succeed. That's not, it, it, that's too oversimplified. Mm-hmm. Anyway, go ahead. I'm sorry. Continue on. Yes. No, more. I think, I think that's, we can you like to stop right here. I think we can stop there. I think what we want, I know we kind of have, we're, switching back and forth between like the trauma and then the first year or first experience of, of living with diabetes. But I think that it's, it's going to be harder than you think. And holding that, like when you're noticing the irritability or the frustration or the sadness, going through these steps, naming it, you know, normalize it, give it perspective, reality, check your expectations, offer that compassion to yourself. Mm-hmm. In that space, you're also building in that resilience, yeah. which is, I think, just a beautiful thing, offering yourself that compassion again through this through this process. Can I say something to, so that people know uh, something behind the scenes? Don't be embarrassed, okay? Oh, I already am. Oh, don't be, <laughs> I always get the feeling that you always feel like we're not doing a good job because I think there's an order in your head about the way you think things should go and that you think when we start conversating about it, you didn't follow the order. But I would like to tell you, I think the conversation is why it's relatable and why people remember it. So I never want you to feel badly about that. I want you to remind you about the guy who sent the note that says that the one, two, three, that that, the grounding, the grounding got him through the death of a parent. And that tell me if I'm wrong, but it always feels like there's a I don't want to call it a type A part of you, but maybe that like wants it to be. Tell me what it is about you. You know what I'm saying. So, so what am I, okay, what am so I seeing? I usually, you are right. Usually I have things that I would love for us to cover in an order in which we go. Mm-hmm. Today, as you might've seen, I, I had notes on the screen. I have scribbles on my paper. We did I was pretty reading well from the today. book. Yeah. Today, today it was it, I, what we went into it and mm-hmm. I was excited and I wasn't quite sure how it was going to go. Yeah. And that makes me feel nervous. It, like, so it's, you get nervous, right? I get nervous because I'm like, I'm not sure where we're going to go, but I was also kind of excited and felt like I had enough in here to share. Uh, but normally yeah, I like to, I like to know where we're going to go. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And if you can hear like when I interject at the end, you go, Oh, that's so good. That means, Oh, that fits here. <laughs> like, yeah. 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 No, I'm like, Oh yes. That's, yeah. That's, I like that. You're almost like, good and job. I can't believe you yeah. did that. Cause I <laughs> listen, I've taken us on excursions before. That's uh-huh. how, I mean, if you're going to do this with me, it's going to happen sometimes. Mm-hmm. When we get to the end, it all gets out. And and the way I know that for sure is super interesting is I'm watching AI digest transcripts of the podcast. Mm-hmm. And when you go back and ask it questions, you can tell all the information's there. 
But if you listen through it and then said, I don't know how to describe this to people and said, is everything here that we meant to be? You'd be like, oh, I'm not sure. Because conversationally, mm. it's hard to know. But once you have something that's smart enough to actually articulate what's in there, the AI, you know it's mm -hmm. in there. And people's minds pick that stuff out. I don't think they could regurgitate it as right. consciously, but I think that subconsciously and intellectually, they now know the information. So there's mm -hmm. something about conversational that works really well. I just, when I see you feel nervous, I always feel bad. Like I actually tried, oh. to, I tried to talk less today to like help you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, yeah, I feel like I, I talked a lot. I think also knowing there are things that are shelved in my brain that I still want to talk about. But I know since we have more episodes in this series, I, I can I, like listen, think out. <laughs> I'd like to make this podcast for another 10 years. So don't worry about it. I got plenty of time. All right. I appreciate you doing this with me. Thank, Thank you. you. Yep. <laughs> I want to thank the Eversense CGM for sponsoring this episode of the Juice Box Podcast and invite you to go to eversensecgm.com slash juicebox to learn more about this terrific device. You can head over now and just absorb everything that the website has to offer. And that way you'll know if Eversense feels right for you. eversensecgm.com slash juicebox. Arden has been getting her diabetes supplies from U.S. Med for three years. You can as well. USMed.com slash juice box or call 888-721-1514. My thanks to U.S. Med for sponsoring this episode and for being longtime sponsors of the Juice Box Podcast. There are links in the show notes and links at juiceboxpodcast.com to U.S. Med and all of the sponsors. A huge thank you to one of today's sponsors, Gvoke Glucagon. Find out more about Gvoke Hypopen at gvokeglucagon.com forward slash juice box. You spell that G V O K E G L U C A G O N dot com forward slash juice box. I know that Facebook has a bad reputation, but please give the private Facebook group for the Juice Box podcast a healthy once over. Juice Box podcast type 1 diabetes. The group now has 47,000 members in it. It gets 150 new members a day. It is completely free. And at the very least, you can watch other people talk about diabetes. And everybody is welcome. Type 1, type 2, gestational, loved ones, everyone is welcome. Go up into the featured tab of the private Facebook group. And there you'll see lists upon lists of all of the management series that are available to you for free in the juice box podcast becoming a member of that group i really think it will help you it will at least give you community you'll be able to kind of lurk around see what people are talking about pick up some tips and tricks maybe you can ask a question or offer some help juice box podcast type 1 diabetes on facebook don't forget if you'd like to check out erica she's at ericaforsyth.com if you're not already subscribed or following in your favorite audio app, please take the time now to do that. It really helps the show. And get those automatic downloads set up so you never miss an episode. Thank you so much for listening. I'll be back very soon with another episode of the Juice Box Podcast. The episode you just heard was professionally edited by Wrong Way Recording. WrongWayRecording.com